Good morning, and thanks for being here this morning. My name is DJ. I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity, and this morning it's my privilege to open up God's Word and lead us in our study of it. So if you have a copy of the Bible this morning, I would invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 7 as we look at verses 7 through 11 this morning. We are in the middle of a study of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Here at Trinity, we love the Bible, and we believe the Bible is how God speaks to us. And so in our preaching, we do a type of teaching called expository preaching, where we most often just open up a book of the Bible, work through it paragraph paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence. We want to understand it in its context and then apply it to everyday life today. Uh, If you didn't get a listening guide on your way in, piece of paper that has an outline of uh, the sermon, it's got the text, a spot for you to take notes. You can slip your hand up. Alex will come down from the back. Make sure that you get one of those as you join me in Matthew chapter seven. I resisted the temptation this morning to emerge from the hut to start the sermon with the Lion King music playing in the background, so you're welcome, or I'm sorry, depending on your perspective of that. Um, But you can see we're all decorated for VBS, thanks to all the volunteers who put in a ton of work over the past few days getting this ready, Uh, and be praying for the next few nights. The kids that are coming, we've got kids from our church, we've got a lot of kids signed up who are from families not connected to Trinity, so pray that God would give us opportunity to share the gospel, to meet new neighbors and friends, uh, and to, to give him glory in all that we do this week. This morning as we get into Matthew, uh, we're going to be talking about God as the giver of gifts. And we're going to be talking about prayer as it relates to those things. And as I was beginning to study the text this week, reminded me of one of my favorite movies, which you might not think immediately would spring to mind uh, with this passage, but it reminded me of the movie Road to Perdition. Not exactly a happy kind of film, a little bit of a downer, but Road to Perdition, if you've seen it, is set in 1920s Chicago, and it's a movie about the mob. Tom Hanks plays a mob enforcer who has to go on the run with his son after his son inadvertently witnesses a hit. And so the mob wants to cover their tracks. They turn on their own. They turn on Tom Hanks and his family. So he and his son have to go on the run to try to survive while they figure out what they're going to do. And while they're on the run, since Tom Hanks, as a mob enforcer, knows how the mob launders their money, they decide they're going to survive on the run by robbing the banks where the mob keeps all their dirty money. So they go around and they start robbing these banks and robbing all the -the off-the-books cash that Tom Hanks knows that these banks are keeping for the mob. And so they bounce around from town to town. Well, after a few successful heists, Tom Hanks' son is about 12 probably in this movie, His son, you know, he's like, hey, I've been helping and we've been doing this. He's been the getaway driver, learned how to drive the car rather comically um, so that they could get away. But he decides, I should get a cut of the money, right? And so there's a great scene in the movie where he's sitting there and he looks up to his dad and he says, you know, I I should be able to have a cut of what we've got. And so Tom Hanks looks at him, he says, how much do you want? And the kid like has this look on his face and he's thinking and he goes, $200, not a bad sum in the 1920s especially. And Tom Hanks goes, okay. And the kid sits there with this big smile on his face, very self-satisfied. But over the course of a few seconds, the smile changed to a bit of a puzzled look. And he goes, wait, could I have had more? And Tom Hanks deadpan says, you'll never know. I say that story this morning because I think that's how our relationship with God in prayer goes a lot of the time, right? Right? We, we are afraid to ask big things because we don't want to feel like, well, we ask it and then it didn't happen and what does that say about my prayer life? And so I think a lot of times we come to God with, we ask for things that we want, but we kind of couch it to make sure that it stays smallish, that something that we know is, is pretty confident that we can get. And I think a lot of times we pray those kind of prayers and God does, as God is wont to do, above and beyond what we could ask or imagine. And it leaves us walking away thinking, wait, could I have had more? We come to this text this morning and we're gonna see Jesus opening up to us the character of God, what God is like, God's nature as someone who delights to give good gifts. And as we see this picture of who God is, and then we see how we're invited to pray because of it, I hope it changes our conception. I hope it gives us boldness to approach God's throne to pray big prayers, and to be resolved, never to walk away from our good and loving Father thinking, wait, could I, could I have had more? Could I have asked for more? Because you have a God who delights to give you good gifts. So this morning, let's look together at Matthew 7. Let's see who he is. Let's see how we should relate to him. And let's 
change ourselves in the week to come to walk in obedience to the word. Matthew 7, starting in verse 7, Jesus continuing his sermon on the mount, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? That's God's word for us this morning. Let's pray and we'll study it together. God, our Father, as we come to you this morning, as we come to your word, we ask that what we know not you would teach us, what we have not you would give us, what we are not you would make us. To the praise of your glorious grace, we ask it in Christ's name, amen. All right, so if you were here last week, you may recall Pastor Todd was talking to us about Jesus' teaching on judgment, very famous passage that opens chapter seven where Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged. And if you've walked around for five minutes in our world, I bet you've heard that text quoted. Pastor Todd talked to us about the fact that that text doesn't necessarily mean what a lot of times we take it to mean, and he explained how Jesus is challenging the way in which we judge and the attitude that we carry with our judgment, and he, you know, he gave us a pretty good explanation of that passage, and so if you were here last week and heard that, and you realize we're walking through this step by step, you might wonder, what's the connection that leads Jesus to start talking about prayer this week? Like, how do we get from point A to point B. How do we go from judge not, take the log out of your own eye before you deal with the speck in your brother's eye to ask and it will be given you? Well, the reason that Jesus makes this transition is because in order to have the kind of careful judgment that Pastor Todd talked to us about last week, and in order to follow the golden rule that Jesus is going to give us in the text we look at next week, in order to do those things, we need God. Right, if you spend any time here at Trinity, you know we're really big on the fact that Christianity is not just do better, try harder, work harder. We realize in order to be the people that God has called us to be, we need his help. We need his spirit working in and through us. And so as we try to be obedient to all of the huge things that Jesus has called us to in this sermon, right? We need God's help. We cannot do it on our own. These are giant tasks laid before us. I want you to just think about the things that we've looked at in chapters five, six, and seven over the last few months. The commands that Jesus has called us to, right? Have a righteousness greater than the most righteous in society. Flee from anger, lust, lies, retaliation. Love your enemies. Pray for those who seek your harm. Give Pray fast in a way that avoids spiritual pride. Set your heart on heavenly things and not earthly things. Don't be anxious about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. And then judge rightly. Deal with the log in your own eye, your own big and obvious sins before you try to take the speck out of the eye of your brother. And as we've listened and read this text and you've listened to sermons, you've probably ended each one thinking, no problem, I got this, this is easy stuff, right? Well, if you are, then I want to talk to you and find out what you're smoking after the service, because this is hard stuff, right? All of us come away from these commands and we think, how am I going to do this? Well, the answer is found in our text this morning. When we see these big challenges, when we see these big commands, we got to ask ourselves two questions. First question, do you actually intend to pursue this stuff? Right, It's a danger that we will be hearers of the word and not doers of the word. James warns us against that in his letter. So do you actually intend to do it? It's one thing to hear Jesus say to do it. Do you actually intend to pursue this? Do you desire to be obedient to these things? If you're a Christian, you should desire this. And you should desire it more and more as time goes on. As we heard about in the Heidelberg Catechism, we do good works, we hate sin more and more. It's a progressive change that God works in our life by his spirit. So we should desire to be obedient to these things. And then the second question becomes, how on earth do you intend to do it? What's your game plan? You expect to just wake up this one morning this week and it'll happen? 
Well, the answer to how, one of the first and primary answers to how do we pursue this stuff is we pray. You ask God. Ask God. It's very simple, right? We're not going to get into rocket science this week. Most weeks when I preach, we don't get into rocket science because if I tried to do that, we'd have problems. It's simple, right? Ask God. It's not necessarily easy, but it's very simple. You ask God for what you need and you will receive it. That's the promise Jesus makes here. That's the shocking promise that he makes here. And he reiterates it with different imagery three times. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Three very simple statements, all reinforcing the same thing. Come to God, ask him, and he will give. Ask him, and he will give. Well, when we read that, when we hear this shocking statement, I imagine the first question you have, if it's like the first question I have, is, Ask for what? Like, what is the it that I will receive, that I will find, that will be open to me? What is it that Jesus is getting at here? Well, first up, the it really isn't even there in the text. So this is a passive phrase in the original Greek that simply emphasized God is a giver. God gives. We put the it in there in the English translation to make it read smoothly in English. But if you want a literal translation of this, it would be something just like, ask and God will give. God is the one who is emphasized as doing the action. It's not the object that is emphasized here. It's God as giver. Ask and God will give. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened. All passive phrases about what God will do to fulfill the actions he's calling us to take. Ask, seek, knock, and he will give. We will find. It will be opened. So what will he give? What will we find? What will be opened to us. That's kind of the million dollar question with this text that we've got to understand if we're going to get it right. What is it that's being promised to us here? What will God give? And the answer is this, whatever is best for you. God will give, you will find, it will be opened, whatever is best for you. That's what's being promised here. Now, why can I say that? It's important that we work this out together. When I say that what God is promising here to give is whatever is best for you, don't just smile and nod because I'm the preacher and I'm standing up here and you're you're back here or it sounds spiritual or it sounds smart, right? We gotta work out why can I say with confidence that that's what God is promising to us here. Todd last week talked a lot about context, right? To understand that text at the beginning of Matthew 7 about judgment, we gotta read it in its context. We can't just yank it out because once you yank it out from the context, you can make it say just about anything you want. So we've gotta understand what is Jesus saying here in context so that we can apply it. A big part of the reason that we do expository preaching here at Trinity is because our job as pastors is not just to teach you the Bible, it's to model to you how we study the Bible, right? To model to you something that you can go home and do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, etc. And if you're gonna do that, you need to pay attention to the context. If you ever walk away from a sermon on a Sunday morning at Trinity and you think, man, I never could have got that from that passage. Like, that's not a compliment for us. That's a sign that we're probably not doing our job right. So we need to look at this together and figure out the reason that we should say what God is promising to give here is whatever is best for us. So let's walk through it. Why doesn't this simply mean he's promising to give us whatever we ask for? That's kind of the obvious question, right? Is Jesus here saying, ask and you will receive, mean I can ask for anything that I want at all and God's promising to give it to me. If you were to pull this out of context and look at it right there, you could see how that reading would come about. And there's the whole name it and claim it crowd that would argue that is what this means, that if you ask for it with enough faith, God will absolutely give it to you. Why doesn't it mean that? Why can we say definitively, that's not what Jesus is promising here? Well, let's look at the context. When we look at the context, we ask questions like, what did Jesus just finish warning us against? Right? At the end of chapter six, a couple weeks ago, what did Jesus just finish warning us against? In Matthew six, let's look at 25 and 33, he said, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. 
Right? We studied that text just a couple weeks ago. And the main point was plain to see, right? Seek after spiritual things first. God knows your situation. God knows your needs. He will take care of you. So don't be anxious about the same things the world is anxious about. Don't, don't wear yourself down, work yourself to the bone trying to get what everybody else wants. But you pursue God. You pursue his kingdom, his righteousness, and he will make sure you're taken care of. So Jesus makes that point. And Jesus makes that point, and then when five minutes later he says, ask and it will be given to you. If you say, well, Jesus, does that mean I can ask for a new BMW and you're promising that God will give it to me? What do you think his response is gonna be? It's gonna go something like, were you just listening to what I said? Don't worry about the same thing the world worries about. Don't be anxious about all these worldly things. God will take care of you. You pursue him first. We, he, we wants us to, he wants to change the way that we're asking, change the things that we're asking for to be the things that we truly should be about, not these little things that we so often get wrapped around the axle over. And it's not just this near context of the Sermon on the Mount. The broader context of the Bible reinforces this as well, right? Especially, we're gonna look at a text here in James that if, for you men who have been at our Bible and Breakfast series lately, this will sound really familiar, right? James 4, 2 and 3. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Hey, that sounds a lot like what Jesus is saying here. But then listen to what James says. You ask and do not receive. Well, huh? Because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You ask and you don't receive. Why? Because you're asking wrongly. You're asking with selfish, worldly motives so that you can spend it on you. You're asking from a sinful heart and God is not going to give you the desires of your sinfulness, right? Because it's not good for you. So James, as he's writing this to people, you can imagine James is the half-brother of Jesus. He's got his brother's words right here ringing in his ears as he writes this. When you ask, you don't have because you don't ask, but when you do ask, you don't get it because you're asking with the wrong motives. What we're seeing here from Jesus when he says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened. When we ask God for good things, he promises to give them to us. He will give us, he will do for us what is best, what is best for us. Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century preacher, said, our heavenly father himself knows how to give far better than we know how to ask. Isn't that freeing? If my spiritual well-being was dependent on me knowing how to ask for all the right things, man, I'm toast. I don't know what I need. My emotions, my desires, they roll day after day after day, depending on what kind of day I'm going through. I need a God who knows what I need better than I even know what I need. I need a God who I can trust to care for me even when my desires are going the wrong direction. Elizabeth Elliot said this, she said, what God gives in answer to our prayers will always be the thing we most urgently need and it will always be sufficient. It will always be that which we most urgently need and it will always be submission, sufficient. Ask and it will be given to you. And author Lori Lyons put it this way. She said, God has three answers to our prayers. Yes, not yet, or I have something better in mind. Whenever you come to God, the answer is going to be one of those three things. Ask and it will be given you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it will be opened. This is not carte blanche to ask for whatever you want in your sinful desires and God's promising to give you a blank check. This is God saying, I will always provide what's best for you. You ask and I will give it or I will give something that's even better. How can we trust him in this, right? How can we have the confidence that God is going to do what is best for us in this case? Well, that's where Jesus spends the rest of his time in this text, in impressing upon us that we can ask, we can seek, we can knock because God delights in doing good to us. God doesn't just promise to do good to us. God delights to do good to us. He delights to bless his children, verse nine through 11. Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. So Jesus gives a couple of illustrations here 
to try to, to get us to think about the way that fathers act towards their children. Right? It's Father's Day, great time to reflect on this. These are a couple simple illustrations to nail this down. And this point that Jesus is making with these illustrations should be the driving force behind our asking, seeking, and knocking, right? Why do we do those things? Because God is like this. Because God is like this and not like we can very often be. Jesus invites us to trust in the character of God, namely that God delights in doing good to his children. He, we can trust he has our best interests at, hearts, at heart, that he knows what's best for us and he wants to do it. He delights to do it. And so to illustrate this, he uses this example of human parents, sinful, fallen human parents. On Father's Day, we come in and, and we can celebrate our dads who have done great and incredible things to us, who have loved us well. And we look at our, ourselves who are parents, we think about what we wanna do for our kids and we wanna be good dads and, and good moms. We wanna be good parents, but we're not perfect, right? None of us here this morning could give a testimony about our perfect dad who always got it right all the time. And none of us are going to be a perfect dad who always gets it right all the time. And Jesus is saying, you know this, you know this reality, you know you're not perfect, but you still know how to do good things for your kids, right? That's the point that he's making here. Which one of you, if your kid asks for some bread, will give him a rock instead? Right? You, you see the point. He's, he's, he's giving this imagery of a parent who would mock their kid because a loaf of bread and a stone can look somewhat similar. So your kid comes up and he says, hey, dad, can I have some bread? And I like, hear kid, have a rock. Ha <laughs> ha. Like, who would do that? That's not what parents do. Or in the same vein, if their kid asked for a fish to eat, would a parent give their kid a snake instead? Right? Some of the fish that would be eaten in that time were like, look kind of like an eel, so it would be, not be uncommon for a fish that looks kind of like a snake. So the kid asks, hey, can I have a fish? And the dad says, yeah, here's a snake. Enjoy that kid trip to the ER, kid. Ha, ah, sucker. Like, we, we see this imagery that Jesus is conjuring up, and it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. If you read on Facebook about a parent who did one of these two things, you'd be like, that's a horrible parent. Who would do that to their kid? Ask for bread and give him a rock and the kid breaks a tooth or ask for fish and give him a snake and the kid gets bit. Like, call the child protective services. Like, this is not what good parents do. So why is Jesus making these awful illustrations? Well, he's arguing from the lesser to the greater. He's saying that if you, being evil sinners, right? That's what he says in verse 11. If you then, who are evil, you're sinful, you're not perfect. Nobody's a perfect parent. Nobody had a perfect parent. But if you who are sinful, imperfect people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more so do you think God knows how to give good gifts to you and delights to give good gifts to you? He's saying that if you can get this right, don't you think God can get this right? Because God's your perfect father. He always knows what is best. It's the same logic that Jesus used back in chapter six when we were talking about anxiousness, right? Matthew 6, 26 through 30, he said, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? You see the same logic being traced through both of those right there? God takes care of the birds of the grass, the birds and the grass, which is true, and you're more important than birds and grass, which is true. So of course, God will take care of you, right? In the same way here, human parents are sinful, that's true. They make lots of mistakes. They get things wrong. That's also true. Yet they still know how to respond to their kids' requests with love and compassion. That's also true, right? And so if that's the case, God is perfect. God never makes mistakes. He never gets anything wrong. So how much more will he know how to respond to your requests with love, compassion, wisdom, and perfection? So when we eagerly ask God to make us more loving, more compassionate, more wise, more generous, we can rest assured that he will do that. He delights to respond to our requests with loving kindness, with compassion, with generosity. 
When we ask him for help to do the things that Jesus calls us to do in this sermon, we know that he will do that, right? That God will respond by giving us the ability by his spirit to grow in godliness, to put sin to death, to walk in these good works that he's called us to walk in. And when we ask God for our desires, our imperfect desires, right? Some of them might be good desires. Some of them might be bad. Some of them might be good, but we don't even know what that good should look like. We can rest assured that God will answer, that he will do that, or he will do something better. God will give us what we're asking for, or he will give us something better than what we're asking for because we don't really even know what we need. He's a good father, He's not an imperfect father who still knows how to give good good gifts to his children. He's the perfect father. He never makes mistakes. And he always is full of compassion for his children. Now here's where it gets tricky for us. Because we understand imperfectly, sometimes better doesn't really feel like better, right? Sometimes we ask and God says, no, I've got something better for you. And to us, it just feels like I didn't get what I want. And it feels like God let me down. Sometimes relief from the sickness does not come. Sometimes the loved one doesn't get better. Sometimes the hardships and the suffering that we so desperately want to avoid comes anyway and sticks around far longer than we're comfortable with. What then? How can that be better? It certainly doesn't feel better. Well, we got a couple of ways that we can look at that. Number one, let's look at the same illustration that Jesus is giving about parents and children, right? Those of you who are parents or those of you who have had parents, which kind of covers everybody, uh, don't you think that there are times when a kid wants something and a parent says no because they've got something better in mind and the kid doesn't understand it? For instance, hey, dad, can I have ice cream for dinner? No. No. Now, to the kid, that feels like when I say, have these green beans instead, how is that better? Like, the kid doesn't understand that you can't just eat ice cream for dinner every single night, or that's going to put you in a really bad place. You need to eat things like green beans and rice and all kind of other things. And so the kid says, this isn't better, but you, because you know things that the kid doesn't know, understand, I'm doing this for your good. I'm doing this because if you just get what you want, it's going to put you in a bad place. We, we get that concept. We can see it in simple everyday things. But what about in big cosmic kind of things, the things that keep us up at night worrying and wondering? Well, we can look at the Bible for that answer, right? We can see the scenario play out over and over through the lives of God's people. How about Joseph? Think back to the Old Testament story of Joseph. Don't you imagine that Joseph probably prayed a lot for deliverance? Deliverance from the hands of his brothers? Deliverance from the Egyptian slavers, deliverance from prison, and and God did deliver him after 20 years, 20 years. How many prayers do you think went up in those 20 years? How many times do you think Joseph was tempted to think, God, how is this good? How is this better than what I'm asking for, than being delivered, returned to my family, whatever the case may be? Didn't Elijah the prophet pray that God would let him die because the situation in the land was so bleak and so hopeless? And God didn't. God kept him alive to keep going, keep fighting, keep following after him, even when it didn't look like that was a good deal. And of course, the most perfect example will come from Jesus himself, who in the garden is gonna pray what? Father, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. And God does not answer that prayer in the affirmative. He gives him something better. Now, to human eyes, it really doesn't look better, right? Jesus is gonna suffer. He's gonna die. He's gonna be crucified. He's gonna feel the wrath of God upon him. But that is what brings salvation to the world. Christ is resurrected. As the Old Testament promises say, you will prolong his days. He will see his offspring. God, Christ comes in the garden and says, let this cup pass from me, Father, but not my will, but your will be done. God accomplishes his will to the end of the salvation of the world. 
we can look through the Bible and see example after example of things not seemingly working out better based on the way that God would have answered a prayer. But we can see from these examples that he's good, that he's faithful, that he's working, he's doing things that we can't even see or imagine. And he's working them out in accordance with his promises. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. We, we quote that verse a lot. You've probably heard that verse one or two times, and it can be easy to kind of throw it out like a cheap cover anytime a situation goes bad. It's not. This is not some trite saying. This is a promise of God that he works all things together for good, even when we don't feel it, even when we can't see the end, when we can't see the exit to the tunnel. God is good. He is our good father. He delights to give good gifts to his children. When you come asking for bread, he is not tossing you a rock. When you come asking for a fish, he's not sliding you a snake. He is a good and perfect father. And because we know this about God, since we understand this wonder about his character, his perfect love, his great wisdom that we'll never reach the end of, and the fact that he delights to do good to us as as his beloved children, what should that drive us to do? It should drive us to ask. It should drive us to seek. It should drive us to knock. John Calvin says, nothing is better adapted to excite us to prayer than a full conviction that we shall be heard. If you know your father is listening, if you know that he hears, of course you're gonna ask, right? I mean, think about this in, in all sorts of areas of everyday life. If you, want, if you wanted to ask something of your boss at work one day this week, and maybe it's something that you don't know what kind of response that you're gonna get, so you've put off asking about it for like two, three weeks. You're nervous because you don't know what's gonna happen. If you knew beyond any doubt that your boss would hear that well and he would take it to heart, wouldn't you be emboldened to ask him? That's the situation we find ourselves in with God. We know he's gonna hear us. We know he's gonna say yes, or he's gonna give us something even better. So why not ask? Why not have that faith emboldened in us to pursue him? And ask big. Be bold. Remember who you're talking to. Don't pray in such a way that you hedge all of your bets and you walk away five minutes later thinking, could I have had more? Ask big. You have been invited into the throne room of the creator of the universe who is your good and loving father. Pastor Alistair Begg put it this way. He said, we will not pray big prayers if we do not pray at all. And if we are self-assured or self-righteous, our prayers at best will be irregular, impersonal, functional, and prosaic. But Jesus was none of those things, nor was Paul. Prayer reminds us who we are and it reminds us who our Father is. Prayer reminds us who our Father is, and you can never ask him for something that is beyond his ability to do. You can never ask him for something that's beyond his ability, and you will never ask him something that exceeds the, the, the distance he's willing to go because of his love for you. He's never gonna say, wow, that's big, that's really for your good, but... Yeah, I don't know that I can quite pull that off. He is able and he is willing to work for your good. How can he who did not withhold from us his own son not also freely give us every good thing? God holds nothing back. And one more from Elizabeth Elliot. Nothing is too big to ask of him. It is God's business to decide if it is good for me. It is my business to obey him. This is a temptation for me a lot, right? It's because I want, to, I want to ask God for things. But at the same time, I want to be like Jesus, right? I want to have the, not my will, but yours, Father. That's a good thing to cultivate. But I know for me, sometimes I can use that as an out, right? I don't want to pray for big things, so I use that phrase, not my will, but yours, so that my tracks are covered if somebody hears me pray for this and then it doesn't happen. Like, I should want God's will to be done, and I should trust him, whatever that may be, but that shouldn't stop me from praying big. Bring him the desires of your heart, right? He's not scared. He's not worried. 
come before him with those requests. It's his business, like Elizabeth Elliot says, to decide if it's good for you or not. Don't worry about that. Ask. You be obedient and ask and seek and knock. And see if you don't end up getting a lot more than you expected off the start, right? The one who is able to do immeasurably beyond anything that we can ask or imagine. And he invites you to ask. What a good father. What a perfect father. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? All right, so application time. And this is a really tough one to do application on, right? What could we possibly take away from Jesus' instruction in this text and do in our lives? That's a joke, right? Are you asking? Are you seeking? Are you knocking? Jesus gives us the application right there in verse seven. He does the work for me, my favorite kind of text. Ask, seek, knock, approach your father. Are you doing this? Are you approaching him in prayer with the boldness and conviction that Jesus invites you to here? Are you asking? Are you seeking? Are you knocking? And if not, why not? Ask yourself that question this morning. Ask it repeatedly this week. If I'm not asking, if I'm not doing those things, why not? Well, perhaps you don't have confidence, you don't have confidence in God's eagerness to do good to you and for you because quite frankly, he's not your dad. You don't have confidence that he's gonna do the things that he says here because you don't have that relationship with him. Now, you might believe he exists in some abstract way. You might believe that he's the man upstairs, some cosmic force that's ordering your life. You might even throw up a Hail Mary to him every now and then when things get really, really bad. But he's not your father. This closeness doesn't exist. And so because of that, you don't have the confidence that he's going to answer when you ask. And so you don't ask. Through faith in Jesus, you are invited to be adopted as his son or daughter. You can be a part of his family today, now. And that's the starting point to this kind of prayer life. That's the starting point to this kind of asking, seeking, knocking. Jesus came to make you a way home, to call you into God's family. So leave your sin, leave your guilt, leave your shame. We talked about repentance in the catechism earlier today. Leave it behind, turn away, hate it more and more and walk and follow after Jesus. If you're here this morning and you'd say, I I wanna do that, I've never done that. I want this kind of closeness. Come talk to me, talk to Pastor Dave, grab us. We, We would love to talk to you. What does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? What does it mean to be a part of his family? Perhaps you have God as your father through Jesus. You say, I'm I'm good there. I'm following after him. I love God. I'm trying to pursue him. But I have a hard time really believing that he has my best interests at heart. Maybe that's where you are this morning. Maybe your earthly dad gave you a few rocks when you asked for bread. And in the back of your mind, you're always expecting God to let you down in the same way. You're waiting for it to happen. Maybe you feel that you just can't trust the Lord. Maybe you feel that the answer you want hasn't come and you can't understand if God really cares, how could I possibly be in the spot that I'm in? How could this possibly be better than what I asked for? Why would God do this? I can't see an answer that makes any degree of sense. I think we all get that to a a degree, right? I think every single one of us in the room this morning have unrealized expectations, unrealized desires that we would say, I've been asking for this, God hasn't done it, and I don't get it. So if that's how you feel this morning, talk about it. Talk about it. Start a conversation. Don't don't hold it all in and just sit here and doubt and wonder, God, how, how how can you be real? How can you be doing this? Why would you do this? This doesn't make any sense. Talk to somebody this week from your community group. Meet with a friend for coffee. Let them know what you're thinking, what you're feeling. Be honest about that. That's okay. Like I said, you're not gonna, you're not gonna grab anybody who just cannot even fathom how you could feel that way because that's part of what it means to live in a fallen world and to follow God. Reach out to one of us on the pastoral team and ask for help. And let's, as a church, let's have those conversations. 
Let's look together at God's promises like this one and look at how and why he calls us to trust them. Let's look at people in the Bible who walked a similar road to the one you're on, and I promise you they exist all over the place. And let's see how God's promises bore out and were true in their lives. Right? These things were written down as an example to us. We're all in the same boat. We're all living in, in a world that has fallen, that has broken. We have desires. And God sometimes grants us the desires of our heart. And sometimes he doesn't. And all of us could sit here and say, I I don't understand how that can be true, how that can be good. Jesus is saying, focus on the character of your father, right? Trust that he's looking out for you. We use the example of of parents and kids. You know, sometimes we got to tell our kids, no, you can't have ice cream for dinner every night. You got to eat the green beans instead. Why do our kids do it? Because they have to. But why do our kids do it? Because at the end of the day, they trust us to look after them, right? They trust us to do what's best. Jesus is holding up the same dynamic with us and the Father. We might come to him sometimes and not get what we want, but Jesus is saying, trust his character. He delights to do good to you, to give good things to you. Trust that what he's giving you is better than even what you ask for. So if we feel that way, we need to submit those feelings and those those doubts to the word of God, to what God has to say about himself. And then the final piece of application, and perhaps the most simple and fitting right now, let's pray. Let's pray because I'm going to close the sermon here right now, but also let's pray as you walk out of here, as you go and live your lives, as you spend your afternoon, as you go to work tomorrow, whatever the case may be, pray. He's waiting, desiring to give good gifts to you. Won't you ask him? Won't you seek? Won't you knock? knowing that you have a good father who delights, not just promises to give give good gifts to his children, he delights to give good gifts to his children with a smile on his face. So ask, seek, knock. Let's pray.